Chapter number one of the Octave of Claudius. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Aaron Rivera. The Octave of Claudius by Barry Payne. Chapter one. Mrs. Witcherly was not quite old. She seemed always to be keeping one foot on the tail of her youth. The poor thing squeaked, but could not quite break away. In her conversation, she would often drag you, all tremulous, with her into the confessional, where you found, to your disappointment, that she had no sins, only errors of diet. She was by way of being a woman of the world, with the world left out. Its place in her Erciston Square salon was taken by the world's understudies. Henry Burnage, who for years had made her salon a habit, would torture himself at times with the thought that he was only a fashionable man's understudy. But the torture did not persist, for his opinion of himself was high and on the whole stable. Of the understudies, there were many. Her rooms were full on Sunday evening. Mr. Wycherley would be seen there sometimes. He sat in corners and was mildly disapproving. He made the money, and Mrs. Wycherley spent it. Still, he acknowledged that his daughter Angela must have every chance, and the salon was in some sense a chance. More often, Mr. Wycherley did not show himself. He liked to take a walk on Sunday evenings, and he frequently took it. He had a dislike, not wholly irrational, to the salon. Reason was a strong point with him. Be rational, Jessica, he would frequently say to his wife. I only ask you to be rational. When he went his walk, she alluded to his headache. Nobody minded. He was not the attraction, neither was she, and they both knew it. But Angela wore pink, and understudies attract one another. Angela petted her papa a good deal, and, in return, he never mentioned anything in which he was seriously and commercially interested. In public, she would sometimes talk to him with endearing facetiousness. This mildly puzzled him. He only dealt in the milder sensations because in private she rarely talked too brightly to him. Mrs. Witcherly's drawing room was not in itself wonderful. The walls were covered with a paper that had a dado to it. She had ordered it some years ago herself, and she regretted it. She knew now that it had been premature and that a paper with a dado did not constitute art's last word with regard to wall decoration. Mr. Witcherly did not think the times were yet ripe for it to be superseded. He had said so more than once. Mrs. Witcherly rather believed in what she called those pretty trifles that make a room look bright. So she concocted some flower holders out of Japanese fans and some velvet that had been on the dress that she had worn when Maria was married. These things afterwards were transferred to a spare and prematurely unoccupied bedroom. It was thought that Angela had been responsible for their removal. Angela considered that the room was irredeemable and thought that cheap attempts at redemption humiliated her. It was late one evening. Mrs. Witcherly's guests had all gone. She had interviewed the hired man in the hall, paid him, swung back into the room again with a declaration that Jameson was invaluable, and now sat down in her rocking chair, facing her daughter, fanning herself rather vehemently with a fan that had been mended. "'Oh, yes, Angela, you may say what you like, but there's never any need to tell Jameson anything. Why he goes on the job instead of taking a permanent place is more than I can imagine. He's just the picture of the perfect butler.' "'All right, Mama, all right,' said Angela, rather irritably. "'He does, but you needn't think that he deceives anybody.' "'I don't wish that he should, dear. Far from it. The Queen herself may know that he's hired for the evening for all that I care. When one is entertaining a great number of people, one supplements one's staff. The very best people have to do it. Yes, drawled Angela, but they have a staff to supplement. Ah, if we were only quite poor. Angela, that is really wicked. If you dislike our means, our moderate means, you would dislike poverty still more. We do our best, and it's too ungrateful of you. Mind, I don't say that I am not fond of a little society myself. Oh, Mama dear, don't be intolerable. I don't know what you mean, but I do know that it's chiefly for your sake that your father consents to these Sunday evenings. And you know that it's the dream of our lives to see you happily married, like Maria. Poverty would be to you life's greatest curse. Mr. Burnage told me tonight that he thought families whose income just touched the full figures really had the hardest fight against vulgarity. But he added, from conjecture and subsequent politeness, that all things were possible to genius. We have the fatal income without the genius, I fancy. 
Ah, Mr. Burnage is one of those rather clever young men. I don't understand him, but he looks very well in a room. Angela, my dear, I must hunt myself up a little supper. I hadn't any. I dare not eat when I'm feeling nervous. It only means that I wake with a fluttering in my side and feel as if the angel of death had summoned me. I'll just go into the dining room and see what I can rescue. She returned in a minute with a champagne bottle, still loyal to the third of its contents, and a plate and a small tumbler. On the plate was a cold cutlet in aspis and a silver fork. On the portion of the plate which still remained untenanted were two chocolate eclairs. She was careful to keep the aspis clear of the eclairs until their turn came. She ate rather greedily. Angela looked geniusly distressed. "'Honesty is a poor word for Jameson,' Mrs. Witcherly remarked as she filled her glass. "'Any other man would have finished the bottle. You can trust him. That's what I feel so much about Jameson. As a tonic for the stomach, I believe that there's nothing.' "'Oh, mamma, mamma," said Angela suddenly. "'Why do we keep on fighting?' I used to love our parties once, but I'm getting to know things. We're ridiculous. We aren't quite what we want to be, and we are the more absurd because in some things we're very near it. I don't think I want to marry. I used to, but I don't now. I certainly don't want to marry any of the underbred young men who come to this house and fall in love with me. I often wonder why I go on trying to be bright and amusing to them, and why I do my best to cover up the rough places and make things go smoothly and cajole Papa and dress as well as I can. The hell the awful hell of this London life. And poor Angela buried her head in a recently purchased cushion and began to sob a little. You distressed me, said Mrs. Witcherly excitedly. I can't bear to see you like this, Angela. I insist that you shall not sob. I cannot digest when my mind is disturbed. Poor Angela, do be comforted. Angela sat up and dried her eyes in silence. Her brief storm had passed. You're feeling low, Mrs. Witcherly continued decisively. Now be guided by me and take something. There are some of these eclairs still left. You may just as well have one. You know what things with cream in them are like on the second day. And chocolate sustaining. Now do. And that, she said, suddenly breaking off as she heard a sound at the front door, is your father's latchkey. Don't let him come in and find you like this. By the time that Mr. Witcherly had entered, Angela had composed herself. Mr. Witcherly was short and bald, with a slight tendency towards rotundity. "'I have had such a walk,' he said with enthusiastic satisfaction as he took a distinctively comfortable chair. "'I went as far as Putney by an omnibus, just as I said I would. Then I struck across the common. Wonderful place. Round by the mill, thinking about Richmond, you know, and then off to the left in Wimbledon. Changed my mind, you see.' From Wimbledon, I took train to Waterloo and walked to the club. I found Bodgers there, and we split a bottle of old port. Bodgers would pay. I hope you've all enjoyed yourself as much as I have. It's been a most successful evening, said Mrs. Witcherly. Do you like the new champagne, Jessica? On the whole, I think it's an improvement. Six pence a bottle cheaper. That's what it is. Be reasonable, Jessica, and don't pretend to know anything about anything. There, kiss me, and good night. Angela, it's time you were off to bed. His lips smacked on her forehead. Hers brushed his cheek. Six pence a bottle cheaper, he murmured to himself again, and went off in a wild approach to hilarity. Mrs. Witcherly turned once more to her daughter. She was feeling quite optimistic. I noticed, Angela, that you talk a good deal to Henry Burnage. Do I? I'm glad you mentioned it, Mama. I won't do it in the future. As a rule, I talk to anyone who isn't talking to anyone else. I haven't a word to say against your manner. It isn't the old-school stately manner exactly. Angela leant forward, her elbows resting on her knees, her pretty face. She was not nearly as pretty as she looked, framed by her warm little hands. At this point, she interrupted her mother. Dear Mama, I'm a flirt. When you can't be what you want to be, it's kind of baby's consolation to be the thing you hate the most. But you must not deceive yourself. It occasionally seems to me that Henry Burnage is less foolish and rather better bred than the average here. But don't imagine that I love him, and he's not in the least in love with me. Well, he's been here off and on for years. He must be a good deal taken by us. I don't say that, as a rule. I would recommend a girl to marry a young commencing barrister. No, no. I'm not so unwise as that. 
but Mr. Burnage has means, independent means, as I ask you to look at the way his rooms are furnished. You may call them what you like, but I call them gorgeous, and then he entertains, not so frequently as we do, nor on so large a scale. But so infinitely better, said Angela fervently. There, you're defending him. What does that mean? It doesn't mean that I tolerate him, and it does not mean that I love him. I know what you want, and it couldn't be done. Why, if he kissed me, or if I thought even that he wanted to kiss me, I should go quite mad, mad with disgust. Oh, Angela, darling, said Mrs. Witcherly, you know that I wouldn't force you into anything. There, good night. We must not sit up any longer, or what will your father say? You'll come directly, won't you? At the drawing-room door, she paused a moment and looked almost beseechingly at her daughter. Angela, she said, I believe that I've had one eclair too many. End of chapter one. Chapter two of The Octave of Claudius. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Aaron Rivera. The Octave of Claudius by Barry Payne. Chapter 2. If Mr. Wycherley had taken his stroll over Wimbledon Common later in the evening, he would have had an opportunity to play the part of the Good Samaritan. There is no role which is more popular. The feeling of self-satisfaction and superiority help to make life enjoyable, and in consequence, it is delightful to rescue. But to be rescued is quite another affair. The thing which is condemned as ingratitude is often a very natural resentment of one who has been placed compulsorily under an obligation. Most men, given a certain number of sensitiveness, would sooner fall among thieves than among good Samaritans. The chance which Mr. Wycherley lost was taken by Dr. Gabriel Lamb. The doctor was returning home rather late. It was already beginning to get dark. When he was within a few yards of the garden gate of his own house, he noticed a young man lying in an awkward position on the grass by a roadside. Dr. Gabriel Lamb bent over him, found him half-conscious, and made a cursory examination of him. The young man was clad in a well-cut tweed suit, worn to utter shabbiness. His boots were in holes. He was lying where he had fallen when he had found he could go no further. His hat was off and had received from the fall a damage with which it was already familiar. His face was thin and at present quite colorless, but it had the tokens of refinement and strength. Dr. Lamb's examination lasted less than a minute. I shall be back directly, he said, and began to run towards his own house. He was a middle-aged man. His head, save for a fringe of reddish hair all around it, was bald. But he was very active. He dashed up the garden drive and into the house where he gave one or two rapid orders to servants and hurriedly prepared what he wanted. In a very few minutes he was out on the roadway again, with a glass in his hand bending over the young man. The doctor's servants had accompanied him, and stood at a few yards' distance, waiting. The young man's eyes were half-closed when the doctor held the glass to his lips. He turned his head away impatiently. "'Drink it at once,' said the doctor sharply. "'Do you want to die?' The young man spoke in a faint whisper, and with some difficulty. "'I'm not a beggar. I'm much obliged. Very natural mistake of yours. I'd, I'd rather you left me alone.' "'I won't, then.' Whoever heard of such nonsense? Any man who is taken suddenly ill accepts help from the first stranger who is not too much of a brute to give it to him. It's no question of begging. Damn it! He went on, getting furious. You shall pay for the hayporth of brandy if you like, but drink it. The young man shook his head. No money, he murmured. That's why I'm... The effort at explanation seemed to be too much for him, and he stopped. All right, then, I'll take your clothes, or you shall work for me. At any rate, I promise you that I will put you under no obligation which you cannot repay. I swear it. Now then. The young man drank the contents of the glass. In a moment or two, his eyes opened wider. He looked reflective. That wasn't brandy, he said. His voice was already a shade stronger. Not brandy alone. There were other things in it. I'm a doctor, you know. Now do you see that house? The young man raised himself into a sitting position, looked at it, and nodded his head. 
That's my house, and I'm going to take you there with the help of my servant. Then you'll be put to bed. In a day or two, you'll be all right. Now, you must place yourself entirely in my hands and trust to me. I'm not going to put you under any obligation. You shall work out your debt. You look like an educated man. Etten in Cambridge, but you couldn't believe it. I believe it entirely. Now then, you shall get up. Steady. There, that's it. Now, slowly. Supported, almost carried, by the doctor and his servant, the young man was taken into the house. It was a house which seemed to have an old quiet in it, a quiet that had been there long. The colors in the interior were low. It was lit softly, without glare. One's footsteps were not heard on the thick carpets. The house was of red brick, but the red had been softened and shaded by time, and the walls were partly covered with ivy. At the back of the house there was a modern addition, which Dr. Lamb had erected for his own purposes. It was a long, low building, and had a separate entrance into the garden. The young man found himself in a large and very comfortable bed. At one end of the room there was a door into a bathroom. At the other end of the room communicated with a dressing room and a small study. Here the doctor's servant did for him all that a valet could do for a man. Soon he was lying in bed, refreshed by a bath, soothed by the luxuriousness that he had missed so much and for so long, dreamily wondering whether it could be all true. He had suffered very much, and this sudden change for the better seemed so strange. He thought, half amusedly, that the doctor had done a foolish thing. He had taken into his house a man of whom he knew nothing, except that he had found him a mere vagrant, shabby and fainting from exhaustion and want of food. But the young man reflected that in the course of his life he had frequently been trusted like this, on sight. Certainly, in some way or another, he must repay the doctor. How? He could not imagine. It did not matter. The doctor had promised to find a way for him. But the doctor's kindness and trust were, he felt, beyond repayment. He began to wonder if they would bring him something to eat. He hoped so. The valet had left the lamp and the candles by his bedside alight, so it seemed certain that he would return. The valet had treated him with the utmost respect as an honored guest and not as a relieved vagabond. If he ever got any money, he would remember the man. Presently, the door opened, and the doctor and the servant entered. The servant carried a small tray, on which were a couple of chocolate and two sandwiches made of toast and some kind of meat jelly. While the young man was eating, he was ordered to eat slowly, the doctor sat down by the bedside and began to talk to him. At first, he was merely medical. Then he said, My name, you know, is Lamb. I'm Dr. Gabriel Lamb. May I ask your name? Mine is Claudius Sandell. I don't really know how to thank you. Not a word, not a word, if you please. Words would certainly be of little good. I hope that I have not been keeping you from any other patients. The doctor smiled. Oh, I don't practice, he said. It was lucky for you, and I think it's lucky for me also, that you chose a Sunday evening for your collapse. I only walk on Sunday evenings, chiefly because it's not church. Ah, yes, quite true. There is a church also on Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon, and on certain occasions in the week. My wife, to whom I hope soon to introduce you, attends every service. She also stays for the after-meetings. You must not, by the way, think that I am an unbeliever. I am not. At one time I always went to church on Sunday evenings, and there was much in it that I enjoyed. But the curates, banalytics the superstitiousness of the people, and the perfectly evil singing of the choir vexed me. Then it occurred to me that if I went for a walk on Sunday evening instead, I could get the service without the church. I could have the sunset and the aspirations, the longing for the far away that it produces. He stopped abruptly and noticed that the servant was listening with a rather puzzled face. He turned to him. Wait outside, Francis, he said. When the man retired, the doctor began to pace the room and went on talking. Under his very thick, sandy eyebrows and long lashes, his gray eyes grew luminous. Sometimes it's in the spring. Damn it, there's nothing like a spring evening. I'm in earnest about it. The poetry of it is so strenuous and yet so quiet, so full of fresh life and yet so full of the old peace that still passes all understanding. But it's always as the service of God that I take my Sunday evening walk. I love the lime trees, trees of the Pentecost, with their leaves turning to tongues of fires they shake under the strokes of wind and sunlight. 
I love the cold purity of the sky on winter evenings that get dark so soon. How all the stars look at me. The heavens declare the glory of God. Ah, I'm talking far too much. Claudius was watching him with keen interest. No, no, he said. Go on. I'm beginning to understand. That really is all. Only on Sunday evenings do I walk, because it's not church, but it is service. The rest of my time is given to work. To work, doctor? But you said that you do not practice. Quite so, I do not, although when I was a younger man I had practiced for a time. It did not content me. One night I was rung up by a woman. I went downstairs and found her hysterical on the doorsteps. She pulled herself together and prayed me to come at once to see her son who was dying. She lived about a mile off. We ran a good deal. She was distressed, and I was sympathetic. When we got there, I found that the boy was not dying, but was slightly bilious. Then I asked myself if that kind of thing was science, as I loved it. If it really assisted the great cause of humanity for which alone I live. I gave up my practice. I study the individual man only when he's likely to throw light on the aggregate. I never work on behalf of the individual. But I tire you. No, I'm not tired. Pardon me, but you are. It is merely the effect of the restorative that makes you feel strong, and that effect will pass off. You are very much run down, and you need rest. You would perhaps like something more to eat. I shall not give it to you. Tomorrow you should be better treated. Good night, Mr. Sandell. Good night. When he got to the door, he paused a moment and said, Do the clothes you were wearing fit you perfectly? Very fairly. It's about all you can say for them. I've got thinner since they were made. That's all right. A tailor can make others from them, I suppose. It will save you the bother of measurements. Good night again. Before Claudius could answer, the doctor had gone. In the passage outside the room, Dr. Lamb was detained for a minute by the valet. Excuse me, sir, but I've seen this Mr. Sandell before. Where? At Cambridge. I was a jip at Trinity, sir, you remember, before I came to you. This Mr. Sandell was really there. It's quite true what he said. Don't make that mistake again, said Dr. Lamb, somewhat impressively. When I told you a few minutes ago that Mr. Sandell was my guest, it ceased to be necessary for you to give him a character for truthfulness or sobriety or early rising or anything else. You will sleep in the dressing room in case Mr. Sandell should want you during the night. If he's unable to sleep or turns faint again, you know what to do, but he won't. I shall want you to go to town tomorrow for me. You must go early. I will give your orders immediately after breakfast. As Dr. Lamb was coming down the stairs, a carriage drove up to the door. Mrs. Lamb had come back from the after-meeting. She placed on the hall table two or three devotional books. Amongst them was her Bible, fastened by an elastic band and bulged with the sheets of written notes. She was rather a short woman, with dark hair and plain anemic face and ecstatic eyes. She looked very young, twenty years younger than the doctor. "'I'm late,' she said to him, "'but I've been very happy, so happy.' We had Mr. Catacomb, as usual, Elijah, and the Believer's Hope. Dr. Lamb looked at his wife and said nothing, then he smiled slightly. When he smiled, his thin lips showed rather large white teeth. She saw the smile, and a nervous expression came into her face. She appeared to be slightly afraid of her husband. They went into the dining room, and a small table supper was laid, and they both sat down. Mrs. Lamb said grace audibly, while her husband stared pensively at a mayonnaise. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of The Octave of Claudius this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Aaron Rivetta. The Octave of Claudius by Barry Payne. Chapter 3. Mrs. Lamb's want of tact was so pronounced that it even overcame her fear of her husband and she still spoke about the service of the church and the great good that she had received from it. He listened politely with attention, occasionally looking up from his plate at her almost inquisitively. At each glance from under the thick sandy eyebrows, and at each slight smile that showed the big white teeth, she faltered. The glance and smile had a kind of reserved meaning in them, 
They forced her into exasperating belief that she was being treated with superiority. She was half inclined to lose her temper, did, indeed, for one moment cut the chicken wing on her plate as if it had been an enemy, but commanded herself. She was not a very clever woman, emotional, half fanatical, with the pathetic want to be good. Dr. Lamb said very little until supper was over, and his few remarks to his wife were commonplace enough. As she rose from the table, he said, I have told them to take the coffee to my room tonight. I can't talk comfortably in these big rooms, and I've got some news for you. Will you come, Hilda? Yes, dear, in one minute. He held open the door for her. She passed into the hall. He stood a moment reflective. His brows were slightly wrinkled. He did not like the substitution of a late cold supper for dinner at the usual time, but it marked Sunday for Hilda. He did not like Hilda to sit down to an evening meal and afternoon dress with her hat on, but it marked Sunday for her. This interested him slightly. He wondered how her observation of Sunday would work out when her day came. There had been signs lately, he noted them all as they came, that her day was very near. He crossed the hall and went down a corridor to the two rooms which constituted the addition which he had made to the house. The first of these rooms was furnished as a study. The walls were covered with books, most of them books of the advanced scientist, some of them books that even an advanced scientist would have classed as heterodox, the work of charlatans. It was brightly lighted. On a side table, the coffee and liqueurs had been placed already. At one end of the room was a door leading into the laboratory. The doctor opened the door and looked in. The laboratory was in darkness, but he reached his hand upward to a button in the wall and switched on the electric light. The lamps reflected themselves on polished mahogany cases and on the bell glass that protected a large microscope from the dust. There was a rather unpleasant smell in the room. Shelves and cabinets were ranged all around the walls. In one corner stood a lead-covered table. On another stood two or three bottles and a measuring glass. The doctor put the bottles back in their places on the shelves and washed the glass at a square stone basin. He had used the things in preparing the restorative. Then he switched off the electric light and went back into the study again, closing the door behind him. Here he sat down, poured out his coffee, tilted a little glass of cognac into it, lit a cigarette, and began to think. He really had a great deal to think about that night. He was interrupted, however, almost immediately by the entrance of his wife. She had changed her dress and was wearing a loose black tea gown. It suited her fairly well, and her pale face now had a pretty tinge of color in it. Dr. Lamb looked at her critically. "'You've changed,' he began. "'Yes. I saw you weren't liking the other.' "'Ah,' said Dr. Lamb. "'That's good of you. It's the curse of the individual that such trifles should matter to him.' There's nothing so small in the impulses of collected humanity, the aggregate. Mankind, he continued, speaking more to himself than to her, is so great, an isolated man so small. You had something to tell me, Hilda said timidly. Ah, yes. He told her how he had found Cloudy Sandell and taken him into the house. It was his intention to keep him for a few days, perhaps weeks, to provide him with clothes and so on. He says that he must repay me, cannot bear the obligation, is very strong on that point. Gabriel, this is one of the queerest things you have done. Of course, it is very kind of you, and I must say that many professing Christians would have been quite content to just have given the man a copper or a sixpence. He would not have taken it, and in that condition it would have been no good to him if he had taken it. No, it was so silly of him to not want to be helped. I rather like him for that. Quite dark hair, you said, and tall, I imagine him. Well, I hope it will turn out all right. But you've done almost more than you need, the best suite of rooms in the house, and in every way the treatment of an honored guest. Quite so. Apart from the fact that a gentleman cannot very well take advantage of another gentleman's poverty in order to humiliate them, there are reasons. You will oblige me by treating him exactly as I have done, as an honored guest. I will do anything to please you, she said humbly, and I must confess that I like you better in this docile mood than in the mood which it has replaced. When you came back to the house tonight, you addressed me as if I were an atheist, which was incorrect of you, as I frequently explained. You also spoke to me about the curate and Elijah and the believer's hope, 
and you are quite aware that I do not discuss such subjects with you. Your god is the projection of the curate upon the average feminine intelligence. You believe in your heart that your god wrote the Bible in English and got it published by Bagster. I cannot share your conception or your view, but I am not an atheist. I love God. That is the reason why I love and serve to the utmost his humanity, and would sacrifice any unit of it in the cause of the aggregate. Now this must be the last time. I leave you your intellectual freedom, and you may go to church, but you may not talk church. Gabriel, did you love me when you married me? Her downcast eyes were raised and looked full at his. I am a man of like passions to others. You made me happy, you know. It was a life of sordid drudgery at home. Papa was always overworked, and Mama was always tired, and there was that trouble with my sister Matilda. You gave me all that money could give, and then, she gasped and caught her breath, our child. Well, go on. Now, I don't know whether you love me or not. I don't even know whether I love you, because I'm afraid of you so. But I know that there's a change. You used even to go to church with me. You were not always locked up in the laboratory. Even now you are good to me. You give me more money than I can spend. You give me presents. You're considerate for me and do things to please me. But I'm shut out of your real life. Oh, Gabriel, I hate science. You should not do that, dear, said the doctor blandly. My interest in you is largely scientific. Don't, she said pathetically, not irritably. Don't look at me as if I were a specimen. Don't be just interested in me. I'm a woman. It wasn't for the money and comfort that I married you. I loved you. You loved me once, Gabriel. Science did not stand first. You used to make concessions to me. I'm making concessions now. By listening to me politely? Yes, you regard all the smaller conventionalities. I do. I have no pretense to transcend humanity. My contempt for the individual includes my individual self. I try to regard all the smaller conventionalities, and to some of them I am really attached. I get vexed at trifles. I am particular about some quite unimportant things. For that reason, I prefer the conventional dinner to the Sunday supper, which is one of my concessions to you, to which you sit down, perspiring and religious, in a hat. And I despise myself for ever thinking about such light things when I realize the greatness of the work before me. Do I love you? My dear Hilda, I do not even love myself. My point of view has been changed by... Don't talk, she broke in passionately, bursting into tears. Don't go on talking. It doesn't comfort me. Love me again, Gabriel. Love me, else I shall hate you. Excessive emotion, said the doctor, is not good for you, and will probably hasten your day. You must go to bed at once. She rose like a whipped child. I'm sorry she said in a low, husky voice. I forgot. I know you don't like scenes, and I'm wanting to try very hard to please you in everything. I'm going. Good night, dear. The doctor raised one of her hands and kissed it, and opened the door for her. She passed out. Halfway up the broad staircase that led to her room, she paused a moment, thinking. What had he meant by hasten her day? He had said once before that her day would come. She knew instinctively that it would be useless to ask him, and put the question by with a kind of despair. In her room, she stood before the glass, surveying herself. The color on her cheeks was slightly disordered. She took a sponge and washed it off. She made up her mind not to use it again. It was of no good for her to try and make herself look pretty any more. And, even if Rouge had given her beauty, that would not have made her husband love her again. Love, she whispered to herself, panting. Then she remembered that it was wicked to use rouge. She had just but come from church and had painted her face like a bad woman. It was wicked of her. She knelt and prayed God to forgive her. Then she rose and took a candle and stepped across the passage to another room. It had been her baby's nursery. She unlocked the door and entered. The room was neatly kept. A little cradle stood in one corner, bedecked and empty. She walked over to it and rocked it a little. Then she opened a drawer and turned over piles of tiny clothes that were not wanted now. My little baby, she whispered. Her eyes were strained and aching and dry, but she cried again in bed that night. 
It was long before Dr. Lamb came to bed. He'd not been working in his laboratory. He had been thinking about Claudius Sandel. The doctor had not had much opportunity to observe him, but, nevertheless, he summed him up. A man whose pride was greater than his instinct of self-preservation. A truthful man. The doctor thought for a long time. Oh, I shall use him. I shall certainly use him, he said to himself at last. A great find. He will quite repay me. Upstairs, Claudius Sandel slept peacefully. End of chapter 3「Chapter Four of the Octave of Claudius. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Aaron Rivera. The Octave of Claudius by Barry Payne. Chapter Four. Yes, said Henry Burnage to himself. I must marry Angela. He paced up and down the soft carpet, thinking about it. He was alone in his well-ordered chambers, smoking a cigarette that was not to be bought in shops. It was a good cigarette, but its flavor was as nothing to the fact that it was not to be bought in shops. It seemed to fill the room with that atmosphere of uniqueness, distinction, speciality that Henry Burnage believed that he loved. He had arrived slowly at his resolution. He rarely hurried important things. He liked to act correctly. And though he would say a passably brilliant thing about the commercial spirit and the middle classes, he very much liked to get on in the world. He had been considering marriage with Angela Witcherly, as one might consider anonymous journalism, in a critical spirit, weighing the arguments for and against. That was the way he had begun, at least. Angela's mother was barely possible. She was too large, too obvious, too good-tempered and she gave too much publicity to that side of her which would have been reserved for the specialist in dyspepsia. Her circle included too generously. Well, once married, Henry Burnage felt that Mrs. Witcherly could be deleted altogether. Then there was her father, a midly commercial person whose Sunday night anxiety, unless he had one of those headaches, seemed to be first to find the background, and then to sit in it. He would not need to be deleted. He would delete himself. He would probably do something for Angela. The commerce was only mildly successful, but Angela was the only unmarried child. It was almost certain there would be something for her. Besides, Henry Burnage's own father had made him a very liberal offer, if he got married. The elder Burnage did not believe that young men kept straight unless they married. Besides, he wanted to see a grandchild. Then there was Angela to be considered. Just here the merely critical consideration became touched by emotion. The material side of Henry Burnage was in love with Angela. He had come under her charm. Now this charm was not peculiar to Angela. Many other girls have it, and it is more easily described in its results. Angela made the men that she met imagine her secrets. She inspired fascinating reverie. Burnage, with all his business qualities, was much given to fascinating reveries. A catalogue's justice would have been unjust to her looks, for her features were slightly irregular. The ebb and flow of color on her dusky cheeks, or a chance movement of her long eyelashes, or the curve of her figure in some chance position that she had taken, would balk dispassionate criticism. She had a store of trifles to throw in the scale against classical beauty, and apparently outweigh it. She had seemed at one time to Burnage to be a flirt. But now he was inclined to think that she had grown serious-hearted and was being hurt by it. He wondered if she cried sometimes at night, just before she went to sleep, because of her thoughts. That would be terrible. She would tell him about it, just give him her warm little hands to hold, cast her eyes down, and make shy confidences. His vanity, caught by his imagination, soared grandly upwards like thistle-down riding in the wind. He began to picture things. Her rapt eyes seemed to look at him, and her low voice to tell him how good he was. He seemed to hear music. The wedding march took its memorable downward sweep, curled over the keynote, and broke at his feet. It moved upwards again, changed to a slow, straining waltz that beat its great wings regularly. Upwards into the rare-field atmosphere of the passionate lover, where the whole world stopped, 
and one kiss continued. He had arrived slowly at his resolution, beginning with criticism and ending in ecstasy, just at the last warming the cold ambition by the fires of love, or the nearest that he could get to love. He was glad that the resolution was taken, and it had been hovering in his mind for some time. He felt a kind of importance and consequence of it. He seemed to himself to be embarking on a fresh epoch in his existence. He dined at his club and dined well. Thoughts of the love-touched future, black coffee, a small glass of kirsch, and another of the cigarettes that could only be obtained by a favor occupied him for the next two minutes. Then he proceeded to write two letters. His first letter was to his father, and Henry Burnage's letters to his father were exceedingly unlike his letters to anybody else. The elder Burnage had started life with a small shop, and although he had long ago retired from his business and he had never been able to feel properly ashamed of it, and he never even said a passably brilliant thing about the commercial spirit and the middle classes. This alone made him different from the kind of man that his son was. The father was somewhat puritanical and quite uncultured. Here again, the son was different. In a more humorous moment, the father would sometimes say, Have you been buying any aesthetic things lately, Henry? What was to be done with such a man? A man who could never succeed in forgetting the back numbers of Punch, a man who is quite crude and point-blank. A man who could never be convinced that he misunderstood another man's point of view, and yet always did misunderstand it. Henry could only sigh drearily, and try to read the essays of Matthew Arnold without noticing that their severest thoughts went straight through his own father, happily ignorant of the assault and quite contented. Just as a mean motive and a more generous motive had made Henry decide to marry Angela, a mixture of motives influenced him in the treatment of his father. He was not without filial affection, but he also wondered occasionally in what proportion his father would, in his last will and testament, divide his property between him and his very plain and unattractive sister. He tried to write his father the kind of letter that his father would like, but he spent as little time as possible on the composition of it, knowing that his father was not critical in such things. Tonight, his letter ran as follows. My dear father, you may be assured that your last letter, stating that you have had no return of the sciatica, gave me great pleasure. I was delighted to hear that you managed to get as far from our house to the cemetery. You must be careful not to overdo it, but I suppose you would not walk that distance without permission from the doctor. Certainly the embrocation which he prescribed seems to have done wonders. So you have got the main drainage at last and are compelled to connect with it. I always said that it would come, and after the initial expenses, you would probably find the arrangement much more satisfactory. I am sorry that the new Vicar is not to your liking. His adoption of the eastward position and other ritualistic practices in face of so many protests seems to me very silly. It is, as you say, a great pity that the living should be in the gifts of Sir Constantine Sandell, a man who has belonged at times to almost every conceivable religious sect. By the way, I am almost certain that I saw Claudius Sandell in the Fulham Road about a month ago, just after I sent you my last letter. It was getting dark, and I cannot be positive. But if I am right, he has very much come down in the world. The man I saw was dressed in the seediest clothes, no stick or gloves, smoking a clay pipe and peering into the window of a small eating house. As I had two other men with me, I was naturally not anxious to claim the acquaintance of apparently, a half-starved tramp. So I hurried on to avoid the recognition. Otherwise, I should have been glad to have lent him a few shillings for the sake of old times together at Cambridge. Of course, we do not know what the quarrel was between Sir Constantine and Claudius. You think that Sir Constantine was in the wrong. He may have been. At the same time, I do not think that a father, however hot-tempered and however eccentric, entirely breaks with his own son for nothing. Why was it that Claudius, who is quite, by the way, being my friend at Trinity, never told me one word of the reason for the quarrel, and parried my questions on the subject? Why is it that, although he has been in London, and knew that he could get my address at the temple, he has never been to see me, and has never sent me his own address? 
it must mean that he is ashamed of something. It is strange that he, who was always thought so wonderful, should have been compelled to leave Cambridge without taking a degree, and should then have gone completely under, while I, who was nobody in particular, took a second in my tripos, and am already beginning to get on at the bar. By the way, is that curious woman, Miss Combe, still at Sir Constantine's? In conclusion, I have something important to say. I feel that you are right, and I accept your very generous offer. You will not be surprised to hear that the lady whom I intend to marry is Angela Witcherly, of whom I have often spoken to you. I am now only waiting my opportunity to make a formal proposal, and I think I may say, without conceit, that I know what her answer will be. Before I do so, I shall be glad to hear from you if you think the alliance suitable. Your affectionate son, Henry Burnage. His next letter was to Luke Monsent, and to him Henry Burnage employed a sort of sham literary style with a good deal of affection, short paragraphs, and capital letters in it. Dear Luke, action and reaction make me distrust all. The swing of the pendulum in one direction seems to take a man so far. It also returns as far. There is no stability. How we clung to the expression of culture through furniture, environment. Nay, I still cling to it. Yet always I shift my ground from time to time. Even now it is better to employ aniline dyes with a duchess than to like the art flower pot that has penetrated Bloomsbury. Stability. If you knew, if you could only know how long I get to it. Now comes some hope at last. You ask what? A woman's eyes that are more beautiful because they are now grown serious. On my part, nights in which I do not sleep, but think entrancingly. Is there not hope of stability there? The bourgeois marry to perpetuate their indifferent species, and I to find anchorage for my soul in calm waters. If so, then, at last, stability. Of other news, nothing. Save that I hear that our friend, Cloudy Sandell, is now definitely gone under, and you thought him very great. Ah, well, it will teach you to distrust. Of your own life, what? Right soon. Yours in these bonds of flesh, Henry Burnage. He did not write in this style to his father, because his father was not sympathetic, would not have understood, and would certainly have called him an ass. But Henry Burnage fancied the style, and probably would have believed that his letter to Luke was rather good. But in one point he was mistaken. Claudius was not yet definitely gone under. In fact, not very long after this date, Dr. Gabriel Lamb wrote a letter to his bankers, asking them to place £8,000 to the credit of Mr. Claudius Sandell, of whom signature he disclosed examples during a period of eight consecutive days, to commence on the following Saturday morning. The circumstances which led to this order may now be recorded. End of chapter 4 Chapter number 5 of The Octave of Claudius This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by L. J. V. The Octave of Claudius by Barry Payne. Chapter 5. Three days after the curious arrival of Claudius Sandell at the house of Dr. Gabriel Lamb, the two men stood together in the garden one morning after breakfast. Claudius was smoking a delicious cigar the first that he had smoked for over a year. He had drunk good coffee. His memory contrasted with the cup of thick that he had been compelled to take a few days before at an early morning stall. He remembered the sharp eyes of the man who had handed it him, and the furtive Jew-boy that had rubbed shoulders with him, and the bad green smell of everything. And now he was looking out on a well-kept garden noting the fruit trees as they spread themselves to the sun along the wall he heard the sleepy hum of the mowing machine where at a little distance a gardener was busy on the lawn he had been refreshed by a long sleep in a cold bath 
he was wearing good clothes. He had fed well and been well treated. It was hard for him to realize that all this was the result of charity, for the kindness that had been shown him had come in the guise of hospitality. Dr. Lamb had acted up to his principle that it was impossible for a gentleman to take advantage of the necessities of another gentleman in order to humiliate him. Come down to the end of the garden, said the doctor cheerily. You haven't half seen the place. The doctor was wearing a short holling jacket and no hat. In one hand he swung a small empty canvas bag. As they went down the path, Claudius happened to make some remarks, with the almost boyish naivete, on the perfection of the house and garden. He had, he said, never seen a place which was so complete in small details, trifles. Now, my dear Sandell, said the doctor, putting one hand on his arm, I am not going to contradict you, but I am going to correct an impression that I believe you must have formed of me. I own that I have taken great care lest there should be anything wrong even in the minutest domestic matters, but you must not think that because I am particular about trifles I admire them or take an interest in them. I assure you that I hate them. I hate them so much that I cannot bear to have them in my mind. If the details of my house and domestic life were wrong, they would always be obtruding themselves upon my attention. I should think about them, and I should detest that. It is the same with money. If a man really hates money, he takes good care that he has enough of it for all his needs, in order that he may not think about it. You found me, said Claudius, without a penny in my pocket, and fainting from exhaustion. But all the same, I assure you that I do not love money. Do not, said the doctor, pleadingly, be so ultra-sensitive, my dear fellow. I like fine feelings, but to be ultra-sensitive is so, so altogether damnable. I assure you that your case was not in my mind when I spoke, and my remark would not apply to you in any case because you are too young. You will make money yet because you hate it. There is plenty of time before you. You're much too good to me, doctor, Claudia said rather seriously. I am inclined to agree with you. One of the gravest curses of poverty and privation is that they make a man who is not used to them sensitive and bad-tempered. I never used to be bad-tempered. There is good evidence of that. Claudius looked as if he did not quite understand, and the doctor went on. I mean, of course, in your physiognomy, you are, on the whole, very good-tempered. You can lose your temper badly for all that. In that, you are not exceptional at all. But it is queer that you have never told a lie and couldn't tell one if you wanted to. Why, said Claudius, I've told any amount of the usual. Quite so. The ordinary social fib that has no other motive but to spare someone's feelings. We may leave that out. That is not dishonorable. You have never told the dishonorable lie, the lie that would get you out of some scrape or be of some advantage to you. But of course, Claudius answered, one doesn't do that. No, I've told dozens of dishonorable lies myself. But there, my system of ethics is different and simpler. There is one great purpose, and all else is subordinate to it. But men in other respects, like yourself, do, as a matter of fact, tell mean lies, or would if the occasion were urgent enough. Now no occasion, however urgent, would make you break your word. Well, one never knows. Claudius found this open praise, as it seemed, of himself very embarrassing, and he hastened to change the subject. If it comes to that, doctor, I have noticed one exceptional point in you. I had flattered myself, the doctor said, that I was composed chiefly of exceptional points. Which do you mean? You talk a great deal of your work, and profess to be devoted to your work, and call it the enthusiasm of your life, and yet you really do work very hard. I've only been here a few days, but I've noticed that. 
I happened to wake at three o'clock this morning and looked out. There was still a light in your laboratory. Now at Cambridge it was different. The men who talked much about their work, as a rule, did least. And to keep an average of your number of hours work per diem was simply a preliminary step to being spun in your tripos. Well, the case is so different. The ordinary man at Cambridge works, I suppose, for the purpose of his tripo, and with the involved purposes of pleasing his people and providing himself with a profession. Oh, yes, those are very good things, of course, but they are not great. If you try to simulate an enthusiasm for work with such purposes, you are likely to use all the energy for the simulation and have none left for the work. Yes, I did work late last night. The doctor's eyes grew brighter and his manner more excited. He gesticulated a little with the hand that held the canvas bag. Last night, Sandell, I stood before the gate, the lock gate that stands between the living and the mystery of life. I tampered with the lock, but I could not force it. I could not get in. But, Sandell, I assure you, I am speaking seriously. Last night, I caught a glimpse between the bars. It makes me breathless. Can you wonder that I am enthusiastic and, Lord, I do keep talking about myself. I wish I did not. I shall become a bore. Will you, said Claudius, if I may speak as frankly of you to you as you have done of me to me, I will say that I have never met any one who interested me so much, and I do not suppose that I shall ever meet any one who will be half so kind to me. Oh, kindness is not in the question at all. For all that I give you, I intend to receive as much again. Practically, you are in a hotel and have the means to pay your bill. Only it does not quite suit either of us to treat each other just like that. No, not a word. I won't be thanked. I assure you that I shall come out of this under a great obligation to you. Now look here, we won't talk of this. I want to show you my rabbits. They reached the end of the garden. Here there was a row of twelve small rabbit hutches standing about two feet from the ground. The hutches were kept very clean and dry, and it was evident that good care was taken of their occupants. I didn't know you were a fancier, said Claudius. Oh, I'm not. These are all of the common kind. They hardly remain here long enough for me to make pets of them, and in a pet one would prefer a little more intelligence. Still, these hutches are well planned, and I think and I like to have them properly fed and cared for until they are wanted. Research, you know, would be impossible without experiment. One is as humane, of course, as it is possible to be under the circumstances. By the way, I want one of these this morning for my work. He opened one of the hutches, and a black doe that had been nibbling green stuff at the entrance scurried away to the far end of the cage. Pressed close to the boards, she watched the two men with soft, furtive, frightened eyes. Pretty creature, isn't it? said the doctor. Now then, my common rabbit, you're wanted. Why didn't you stand erect and have articulate speech and wear white ties in the evening? Then you would have had a god and lost him and worried yourself about it at nights when you had no one to talk to and never got any further. And also, you would have bragged about it. People always do. You weren't consulted, neither was I. Now you are going to die in a dream. But first, you've got to tell me what you know, but don't know that you know. He stretched his great hand into the hutch and grasped the doe by the neck. Come now, he said pleasantly, as she kicked and struggled. Don't you be frightened, my little dear. Then he dropped her into the canvas bag. The two men walked on to the garden entrance of the laboratory. Vivisection had been the subject of debates at which Claudius had been present. They had not been, as a rule, very well-informed debates. It had been a case of brutality against sentimentality and had not interested him very much. One of the most potent arguments for vivisection that he had yet 
come across was that Dr. Gabriel Lamb practiced it. He mentioned this to the doctor. Dr. Lamb put down his canvas bag in the garden path and fumbled for the key of the laboratory door. He was an astonishing grotesque figure. The short holland jacket did not seem to go well with the bald head, with its fringes of auburn hair. Curious traces of scientist, sensualist, and poet seemed to flit across his face hopelessly inconsistent and passing in a moment between a box edging of either side of the path the black doe rabbit jumped and struggled in the bag that imprisoned it vivisection i am not of course opposed to it at the same time i realize its limitations it has taught us what we know about physiology and will teach us more but it will never teach us everything as practiced at present and nothing less than everything is of much good to myself. I have got to pass through that gate of which I spoke to you. See here. You know, of course, that a pig is internally much the same as a man. But the pig's nervous constitution, a very important factor, mark you, is as different from a man. Once more he broke off abruptly. You are provoking me to become a scientific bore, he went on and all bores are hateful, and the scientific bore is the worst of the lot. Well, doctor, said Claudius, I can only say again that I am not bored. Now, by the way, I could not, perhaps, do a good hard day's work, but I am so far recovered that a few hours' secretarial work would not hurt me. May I not undertake your correspondence for you, or copy your scientific memorandum? You have already decided that I am to be trusted, and I should not abuse your confidence, and I need not tell you that I should be careful. I should give you the best of such ability as I have. That is quite so, said the doctor. If I were the usual philanthropist, I should probably fake up some secretarial work for you to do. But I am not and the work for which I want your assistance is far more serious and important. I will tell you about it when the time comes. In the meantime, if you would order the Victoria and take my wife for a drive, I know she would be delighted. No, you'd rather drive yourself, I think. Have the dog cart and the bay mare. Oh, yes, and you'd better ask for her, or they will give you peach blossom. Who's a good horse, but not so amusing? Claudius drove the bay mare, and she did not give him much leisure for conversation. She was a beauty, but she needed driving. Mrs. Lamb watched him earnestly all the way, and only spoke to praise him. The doctor never drove the mare himself. It is curious that even the cleverest man will fail to notice when things are significant if they concerned himself. Claudius had that morning omitted to notice several things. End of chapter 5《Chapter 6 of the Octave of Claudius》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by L. J. V. The Octave of Claudius by Barry Payne Chapter 6 It was a comfortable house to live in, Claudius decided, but there were some queer points about it. In the first place, there were no visitors. It suited the doctor, apparently, to live in a certain style. Dinner, for instance, was distinctly a formal function but he evidently did not think there was any necessity for witnesses of his severe taste in appointments or of his conversation, which at times was brilliant, or of the excellence of his chef and his cellar. In a word, he did, merely to soothe himself, what most people do in order to keep up appearances. No stranger, apparently, with the exception of Claudius, ever trod those soft carpets or tasted those exquisite wines or heard the doctor on those few occasions when it pleased him to put 
his great ideas aside and be merely eccentrically witty mrs lamb must have realized that claudius would notice this she took particular pains to tell him that the doctor was a recluse and would see no one and so on there was something queer too about mrs lamb she was religious ardently religious but yet she was an untamable woman religion might inspire her claudius thought and he was angry with himself for such analysis of his hostess but it would never hold her her eyes looked searchingly at him out of her pale face and he saw in them this much at least that she was not a woman to be taken lightly or easily with regard to her feelings towards her husband she was very much in doubt but he was certain that she was afraid of him and what was the doctor's own position he was formally courteous to his wife in public further he did not talk her over with claudius further he took an evident interest in her but for all that claudius could not persuade himself that the interest which the doctor took in his wife was the same as the interest which a man takes in the woman whom he loves it seemed a colder more scientific thing claudius could not explain it he could only wonder but one point seemed stranger to him than all the curious way in which he was taken for granted he had been in the house for days and he had come into it as a broken-down tramp the lambs had only his word for it that he was not a broken-down tramp yet the days went by and no question was put to him about his past and very little was said about his payment of his obligation nothing in fact except the doctor's indefinite assurance that it would be all right as a rule he spent the greater part of the day with mrs lamb he drove her out read to her educated her taste in music she began to make some sort of confidence in him she told him she had had a very great sorrow and that religion had been a consolation to her in it once she began to talk about the doctor with her eyes fixed nervously on the door of the room lest he should enter suddenly claudius did not like this gabriel was very clever she said but it was too awful he despised religion he seemed to be entirely given up to one thing she did not know whither it was leading but she had an uncomfortable sensation that it was leading somewhere that they were on the verge of things then she hesitated and looked shyly down at her own knees and said with seeming irrelevance i want you mr sandell to be very careful in what way in my dealings with the doctor why surely he broke off and laughed you must not have these presentiments there is nothing to be afraid of in a scientific enthusiasm isn't there she said rather drearily claudius had no desire whatsoever to make confidences if anything he was inclined to reserve but he felt that his host and hostess had a claim to know something about him and it was characteristic of him that he had to satisfy all claims of which he was conscious whether they were pressed or not he chose this opportunity one night after dinner the dining room was large and irregular in shape the table an oval oak table was laid in a square recess and brightly lit with wax candles the rest of the room was almost in shadow it had been rather an interesting dinner the doctor starting from a case in the papers that morning had gone on to a theory that suicide was largely the result of a sense of humor people killed themselves because they saw that any further existence would be ridiculous it was a pity but those who had a sense of humor generally had it over accentuated had claudius ever noticed that had it never occurred to him how much better things must be on the moon yes of course there were usual shilling manual baby arguments to show that the atmosphere and temperature of the moon did not permit the existence of human beings it was the common confusion of beings with bodies there were certainly beings on the moon and the bodies did not matter things will be much better there because nothing there would be over accentuated the consuming passion of love that we men and women feel 
would be on the moon a mild preference our athanasian creed would be there a hesitating assent to matthew arnold's definition dinner would be afternoon tea and afternoon tea would be no more than one transient dreamy glance at the thinnest possible bread and butter everything would be toned down my own enthusiasm he concluded will be nothing more than the feeling which makes a boy buy the sixpenny chemical cabinet do four tricks break one test tube and swoop the remainder for a specimen of common quartz with which to initiate a new geological passion claudius took up the idea and went on with it mirthfully he and the doctor combined their suggestions the wildest suggestions of what this under accentuated toned down moon like would be mrs lamb consciously well dressed watched them in silence sometimes with anxious eyes as she wondered if all this was quite religious sometimes with quite a different expression as she thought what a good thing it was to look at claudius and hear his musical voice and then grew afraid of the thought the doctor said that the moon life would be heavenly why not have it why not reconstruct your existence here why not reduce your enthusiasm to the schoolboy's whim the doctor became suddenly serious that is my own fault for speaking inaccurately he said i spoke of my own enthusiasm and i was wrong the enthusiasm is not mine but i am its i belong to it i am its slave body and soul i am claimed by the service of humanity and given up to it but a willing slave the doctor did not answer for a moment he went on peeling a peach his white nervous fingers and the knife in them suggesting the rapid neatness of a surgical operation he seemed to be thinking deeply i really do not know he said at last i never wanted it to come and i never resisted it it is i should say that some powerful tendency has absorbed my will into it i feel like part of a natural law yes that's absurd but i really grope for words to describe my sensations and i do not get them very well and your work is for the good of humanity ultimately i wish i had some part in it my end in view in my own work was so much more selfish perhaps that was why i failed i have never told you about it dr lamb shot a rapid glance at his wife and it was she who answered yes you must not speak about it mr sandell if the subject hurts you on the contrary he protested i am anxious to tell you the one thing i can do apparently is to prevent you from being generous in the dark no no said mrs lamb leaning back in her chair you must not imply that we could possibly mistrust you that is hard on us she spoke earnestly the doctor looked at her significantly she was saying just what he wished but he was very well aware that she was not saying it because he wished it nor from mere politeness but because she really meant it it confirmed a vague notion that had crossed his mind that day it enabled him as he thought over his future plans to see where there was a possible weak spot the whole thought went through his mind in a flash quite so he murmured as he passed the tips of his fingers gently through the rose water in the bowl beside him quite so i should really like to tell you said claudius i think it would interest you mrs lamb leaned her elbows on the table and her head on her hands and looked at him intently ah that is undoubted it would be very good of you said the doctor at this moment a servant came forward with the coffee and dr lamb gave a rapid order the coffee and and everything we are likely to want on the lawn at once you would rather the doctor went on inquiringly turning to the others the night is so hot and i thought it would be pleasanter to talk out there they both thought it a capital idea mrs lamb's maid had entered the room with an oriental shawl in her hand mrs lamb adjusted it carefully over her head and shoulders she was a curiously grotesque figure in that shawl her dinner dress had all that madame elise could do for mortal woman the pallor of her face and the darkness of her hair were noticeable 
She missed being beautiful. She looked like an Egyptian dissenter that had known Bond Street. The world had chosen her dress. The flesh and the spirit showed alternately in the expression of her face. Outside was growing dusk. A big rug had been spread over the grass. On it were lounge chairs and a low table. On the table were the smoking apparatus and the wonderful Madeira that the doctor liked to taste after dinner. The tiny Roman lamp gave a minute weird flame. The servant handed the coffee and withdrew. The two men lighted their cigars from the lamp. Now, said the doctor, if you are ready, Mr. Sandell. Claudius began. I think, he said slowly, that the thing I have wanted most of all through life has been freedom, the absence of limitation. I have often thought that I would be willing merely to taste it and then die, yet I have never tasted it. As for my birth, I am the only son of my father, and my recollection of my mother, who died when I was a child, is very vague. My father, Sir Constantine Sandell, his knighthood was one of the birthday honors in the year that I was born, and it is an honor that he has since regretted, would have been considered in some respects an indulgent man. At Eton, I know now, I had very much more pocket money than was good for me. At the age of sixteen, I got the parental sanction to the use of tobacco. Well, my father is himself a smoker. At Cambridge, again, my allowance was very generous. But in important points, I was never free. Now, religion is, I suppose, an important point. Mrs. Lamb looked up at the gray sky and then slowly down again. Claudius continued, Religion was, is, and always will be a most important point to my father. Unfortunately, it is a point on which he has never been able to satisfy himself. He has changed his religion times without number. He is about due into Buddhism by now, he said with a bitter laugh, so I do not see what else is left. No, I am not joking, and I was always compelled to follow any sect with which he happened to be in sympathy. I myself have been a Scot Presbyterian, an English low churchman, and an English ritualist. I have found that the truth was in the Greek church alone. I have been a Roman Catholic. I have followed my father into the religion of three persons and no God, which has its dwelling somewhere off Feather Lane. I have tried with him to find consolation in metaphysics that neither of us could quite understand, then I listened to the sermons of Parker, and after that to Voicy. I did not mind. I was only a boy. Fellows always believed what their fathers believed, and it was all in the day's work. It was at the call to spiritualism that I rebelled. By this time, I was at Cambridge and had begun to think. Now my father had invited to our place a professed medium from London, a Miss Matilda Comby. At this moment, the doctor and Mrs. Lamb exchanged glances, as though the name of Miss Matilda Comby were significant. It was almost dark. Claudius noticed nothing and continued. For all I know to the contrary, Miss Matilda Comby may be there still. With all that I have against her, I must own that she is a distinctly clever woman. I began to study conjuring tricks. I paid, with my father's money, for lessons from professors. When I thought that the time was ripe, I exposed Miss Matilda Comby and showed to my father that the absolute proof, as he called it, was ingenious, but that they did better at the Egyptian Hall. I might as well have spoken to the pyramids. Miss Matilda Comby was clever and plausible. She had warned my father against the very explanations that I offered. She considered that her position was confirmed and told me in so many words that I was a blasphemer. All that was the cause of your quarrel with your father, said Dr. Lamb dreamily. No, he still had hopes of me. We did quarrel, of course, but the real reason is much more difficult to tell. One day at Cambridge, I had a letter from him that surprised me and distressed me a good deal. 
I knew that this woman, Matilda Comby, had a great influence over my father, but I did not guess how great until I read that letter. Briefly and preemptorily ordered me to marry Matilda Comby, a woman ten years older than myself, a woman whom I had always had the greatest difficulty to treat with even the barest civility, a woman whom I knew to be a fraudulent charlatan. During the whole of a year, I had been doing my best to get this woman turned out of our house, and now I was calmly told that I was to marry her. The spirits had willed it. The spirits were very anxious for it. The spirits had foretold that it would be a singularly blessed union. It sounds like madness, yet in all business matters my father at this very time was showing himself particularly sane particularly judicious that said the doctor is not uncommon but tilda comby also must have had some talent for speculative business my father is i suppose a very wealthy man with all her influence she doubted at first if she could persuade him to leave his entire property away from me on money matters he was too sane but it had probably occurred to her that she might marry me and come into the money that way the spirits had suggested the marriage but there was never any doubt that the spirits were merely matilda comby one moment said mrs lamb rather shyly matilda i mean miss comby was a charlatan of course i think myself that spiritualism is wicked but has it not occurred to you that possibly she was really it is so hard to be certain really in love with you impossible mrs lamb i had always made it fairly clear that i despised her sometimes you know that does not make any difference well i do not think that her subsequent behaviour showed that she was very fond of me at first i treated the thing as a joke but i soon saw that my father was in earnest then i refused point blank now my father does not take point-blank refusals nicely as a rule and i expected a storm on the contrary i got a very patient letter the spirits had been at it again they had told him that i was secretly engaged to another woman and that it was for this reason i had refused but that it would be to the advantage and happiness of the other woman if i gave her up i replied that there was no other woman in the case at all as a matter of fact although it is not a particularly interesting fact i have never been in love in my life and i repeated my refusal his next letter accused me of having trifled with matilda comby's affection oh it was the wildest business matilda comby never appeared directly in it at all but it was obvious that her hand guided my father's in every letter that he wrote i need not give you details of all the correspondence at last he called me a liar and i sent him a letter which i now regret for after all i am his son that finished it i had a brief communication from him to the effect that he did not wish to see me or hear from me again he enclosed me a check for one quarter's allowance in advance and told me that i was to expect nothing further from him either during his lifetime or after his death i sent the check back well there i was with a bank balance of fifty pounds and the world before me it was very cruel of him said mrs lamb it was very cruel and unjust she shivered slightly ah the doctor said it has turned a little chilly hasn't it let us finish the story indoors in my study sandell i have got some of that tobacco about which you were speaking if you care to try it thanks very much said sandell i should be delighted to try the tobacco but I must get my pipe first from upstairs. As soon as he had gone upstairs, Dr. Lamb turned briskly to his wife. Matilda Comby, he said, your sister? I, I fear so. Why is she going by her maiden name? Oh, I see. Yes, her husband. I thought she would go back to it after her husband went away, but I know no more for certain than you do she had stopped writing letters to us you know gabriel even before my marriage it is possible that her husband may have died in died there 
ah yes my wife's sister originally ran away with a fraudulent company promoter he married her and got into difficulties he is now if alive doing a term of penal servitude so your sister resumes her maiden name becomes a common swindler and attempts bigamy what trifles these things are they ought not to concern me and yet hilda i should prefer that you did not mention these facts to mr sandell but they give him the means of reconciliation with his father he will never take the first step in that direction besides why sacrifice any man's good opinion of you how will you be regarded if you say that you are the sister of matilda Combe, with involuntary dislike and distrust but i might write to sir charles anonymously giving proof of my statements quite so admirable but you must get proof unless you know that the convict is still alive you have no case find that out first how i have not the least idea be clear of your facts before you sacrifice sisterly affection to your passion for he paused a moment and added your passion for justice and reconciliation i will do that gabriel i won't say anything to mr sandell how happy he will be to get back in his right place again there run along hilda he will be down in the study by now join him and say i will be there in a moment i have a short note to write which must go to-night when she had gone he sat down before the fire with his head in his hands thrusting fingers into the fringe of his hair his brow wrinkled and then cleared he smiled horribly to himself hilda's letter cannot go for three or four days i think that i can finish my business with claudius sandell to-night to-morrow at the latest after i have got him once got him bound by his word after that there may be as much reconciliation as you please my dear hilda because it will not make any difference praise god he rose and paced the room excitedly praise god in the highest he said with fervour he sat down and scribbled a brief note and gave it to a servant then he crossed the hall and went down the passage to the study i wonder he thought to himself does hilda think that i notice nothing nothing at all she is falling in love with sandell i use that he is entirely honourable i use that i have been kind to him and i use that and now we really progress end of chapter six chapter seven of the octave of claudius this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by dan grzinski the octave of claudius by barry payne chapter seven the rest of the story claudius had to tell need not be told in his own words he had come to london with his fifty pounds in his pocket and had taken cheap lodgings in bloomsbury he meant to live economically but he did not quite know how to do it he also meant to write and he did not quite know how to do that either it was probably his acquaintance with burnage and monsett at cambridge that had given him this idea of making a living by literature these two men had been actually printed in a london paper burnage once and monsett twice in all three cases it was poetry and unremunerated claudius did not think that he could write poetry he cheerfully acknowledged in burnage and monsett their superior talents but in common with most men he wanted to tell a story and unlike most men he had a story to tell he had had it for a long time he remembered vaguely what had started it he had been one summer evening on a country railway station and as he waited for the train he had read the advertisements and some chance line of the merest foolishness had been whimsical enough to give him a suggestion looking up he saw at the further end of the platform a woman standing silhouetted against the sunset sky and the sight of her had carried the suggestion on 
it had all been forgotten next day and all remembered many days afterwards since that time it had gone through a long period of change and growth in his mind until he knew all the people of his story intimately and its incidents had become like incidents in his own career now when he had to make his own livelihood he thought he would write his own novel both burnage and monset had drawn for themselves brilliant pictures of literary success and claudius had listened he knew that such success was not for him he merely hoped to write a passable readable and consequently saleable story there was nothing else that he cared to do while he was learning how to write he was surprised to find there was so very much to learn and learning how to live economically the fifty pounds slipped away there came a day when he left his bloomsbury lodgings and took all his personal belongings to a shop in the fulham road nominally and externally was a second-hand furniture shop but there was really nothing that its proprietor would not buy and sell he was an obese man with a little voice and a quick narrow eye and a watch chain like a golden snake that suns itself on a hillock to this man claudius sold all his books and almost all his clothes leaving himself hardly enough to keep himself warm it was late winter now sir said the man when the last iniquitous bargain had been completed is there anything else i buy anything and sell anything think now sir any little bits of furniture old carpets or rugs fetch em away in my own cart and give you no trouble or bedding now i give a fair price for that claudius being in a rather mad and bitter mood had answered that he would sell himself body and soul for one thousand pounds and one year to spend it in come now sir the man went on joking apart i'm not joking i've nothing else to sell and i mean what i say supposing the man said rubbing his fat chin the law allowed it and i could take you up somehow I might risk two hundred pounds and give you your year. It'd be a speculation, but there, there, where'd my security be? No, that's all nonsense. Claudius went off with something under ten pounds in his pockets. Instead of two rooms in Bloomsbury, he now took one small and dirty room in a back street in the Fulham neighborhood. Here he almost starved himself and constantly overworked himself. He had intended at one time to write his novel to make his living. Now he chiefly wanted to live in order to write his novel well. It was, as it were, a race against time to get the novel finished, as he would have it, before the little money that he had gave out. Hopelessly improvident and unpractical, he made no calculation for a possible future when the novel might be finished and prove a failure. His experiences in those lower strata of London in which he now lived had helped to make him bitter and angry with the world, so that he told himself that when his novel was finished he would no longer want to live in the world at all. It seemed to be a world in which there was no generosity and no sense of what was really valuable. To guess the motives of those with whom he came in contact he persuaded himself that he had only to guess the meanest possible in order to be always right. The struggle for life hardly seemed worth while. Sore as he still was at the treatment he had received from his father, his depression was further increased by his miserable surroundings, his semi-starvation, his occasional loss of his belief in his power to write at all, and his terrible loneliness. The latter was his own proud and foolish fault. It is true that the friends he might have had in London were quite singularly few, but still there were some, partly from the belief that he would work best if he worked alone, and still more from a reluctance to meet in his adversity those whom he had known in his prosperity, or to discuss the quarrel with his father. Claudius had kept to himself otherwise burnage to do him justice would have been willing staunch and loyal to have walked hand in hand with his lonely embryo novelist until that point when claudius really needed a friend lady verrider 
an old friend of the Sandell family, a kindly and worldly woman who was fond of Claudius, would have gone with him much further, and there were others of less importance who would have been glad to see him, but Claudius would have none of them. The lower he sank in poverty and dejection, the more obstinate he became on this point. He had much the same instinct that makes the wounded animal hide itself. On the day that the novel was finished, Claudius sent it off to a publishing firm. It came back almost directly, and he sent it to another. He paid his landlady, and had one shilling left in his pocket, and now he thought that he could die quite easily, and soon found that he could not. He was young, and unable to rid himself of the instinctive love of life. There were many ways in which a man of good character and education and some abilities could make a fair livelihood. None of them appealed to his tastes particularly, but he determined to adopt one of them, any one, only it was necessary to have a little money first. He must be able to buy an outfit and pay a railway fare, or he could do nothing. If the publishers accepted his novel, he determined to sink his pride and ask for an advance from them. This was his only chance. He had, in his letter to them, asked them to let him have their opinion as soon as possible, and somehow or other he must hang on until their letter came. He had only one shilling on which to wait. To speak accurately, he had only eleven pence, for the landlady had intimated that she would charge one penny for taking in the letter for him when he was no longer her lodger. As it was necessary to make his eleven pence last as long as possible, he considered that it would be absurd to spend any of it on a bed. The early summer had begun now, fortunately and the nights were just warm enough to make it possible to keep in the open air without killing oneself. He had found a spot away on Wimbledon Common where it was unlikely that anyone would interfere with him. There he slept for nine successive nights. Indeed, he spent most of the days there, too, for he found himself too weak to do very much walking about. On the morning of the tenth he had only one penny left out of the shilling which the landlady would want if there was a letter for him. He walked slowly to his old lodging in Fulham and inquired if there was a letter. There was a letter, and the novel had come back. The landlady refused to take his penny and said that he could leave the parcel with her. His first sensation was one of intense delight that he would now be able to buy something to eat. He hurried off. When he got to the baker's shop, he was so breathless that he could hardly ask for what he wanted. He bought a penny loaf and hid it under his coat, breaking bits of it off and eating them as he went along. It was very beautiful bread, he thought. When he had finished half the bread, he put the rest in his pocket. He had a vague idea that when he had come to the end of the bread, he would have come to the end of everything. It was with the greatest difficulty that he walked back to Wimbledon Common. There, among some verze bushes, out of sight he lay down. Late in the evening he finished his bread. He did not sleep that night, but in the early morning he dozed off for an hour or two. When he awoke, the world seemed to be very far off. Nothing that he had ever said or done seemed to him to be quite real. There was no gnawing of hunger now and even the instinctive craving for mere life had left him. He did not think about his novel at all, but he noticed very small things. He picked a big leaf and counted the veins in it carefully. A gradual drowsiness came over him, and he had moments when his consciousness seemed to go, and he was not sure whether he was walking or lying down. It was on that night, as has already been described, the doctor found him. Claudius did not tell all this. He gave the bare facts without comment, and hardly recorded at all what his sensations had been. When he had finished, Mrs. Lamb rose and said quietly, "'That has been very interesting to me, Mr. Sandell. I am sorry that you suffered so much. You must not suffer any more. Life must be made easy for you.' "'It has been already too easy, I am afraid. I am tired and must say good-night.' She gave him her hand, it shook visibly, and even Sandell noticed that she seemed to be, with difficulty, 
concealing some emotion. He reproached himself. "'Ah, Mrs. Lamb,' he said, "'you must not believe too much in my own story of my own sufferings. One is ignobly tempted to make the most of such things when one is speaking to sympathetic people.' no she said you did not do that but i certainly am sympathetic good night mr sandell good night gabriel dr lamb looked at her curiously from narrowed eyes he looked like a chess player hovering over a great and final move whose attention has been for a moment distracted good night my dear he said when she had got upstairs that night, she hesitated a moment before the door of the room that had been her dead baby's nursery. Her thin white hand touched the handle of the door, and then left it. She dared not go in. In her own room, she flung herself on the bed. After a minute or two, she rose and knelt down. There were prayers which she said in a certain formal order every night. She began the first of them in a low voice almighty and most merciful. Then she stopped suddenly, her whole body shaken by a dry sob. "'God help me!' she wailed. "'God help me! I'm a wicked woman. I hate Gabriel. I hate him. Hate him. Make me love him again. Take away my sin, my sin that I can't help or fight against any more.' Even in the moment of her prayer, she felt no faintest hope. This sudden, awful love for Claudius that had come upon her seemed to have entered too deeply to be part of her, so that not even the fires of torment could burn it out. In great anguish she prayed on, Was I not tried enough and heard enough? Every day I see women in the street that have their babies with them, and they're laughing. They don't know that they're driving me mad. They don't know it but they are. I bore it all when my darling was taken away from me. I bore it all when I lost Gabriel's love, too. Only have mercy now. Do not let me be wicked. Oh, God! Once more she stopped suddenly. This time she rose to her feet. It's no use, she said. God has left me. She did not sob any more at all. She was perfectly quiet. When the dawn stole into her room hours afterwards, she still lay with eyes wide open. Her hands rested quietly by her side. All through her sleepless hours she had hardly moved. It was such a little thing to lose one's sleep, when one had lost one's child, and love, and God. End of chapter 7